right, welcome everyone. Uh, happy to have you all here. By the uh, dancing trees, you can see we're about to take a trip to SVG Island. This presentation isn't focused on a specific Elixir topic, but instead takes you on our journey of developing custom SVG charts for use in Phoenix Live Views. Let's get started. Hello all, I'm Max. I use they, them pronouns. My counterpart here is Mark, he, him. We are both software engineers at Gridpoint, working on separate teams, but we partnered up to explore SVG Island together. Why explore SVG Island? Well, we have a lot of data that we need to visualize. We have top-notch designers, and they have dreamed up several creative ways to best inform our customers. With these design challenges, we need a robust charting solution to bring these visualizations to life. Here is an example of a bar chart from design. Wow, what a beauty. <laughs> I'm going to break down this chart and try to convey its complexity. First off, we have a multi-series chart, meaning that for every x value, we have several y values. These are the colored bars you see, which need to be colored individually and have the ability to swap color palettes for different data sets. We also need to support gaps in our data set, which you can see by the grayed out months. The final elements are the Y labels and the corresponding background line for each. To top it off, this is just one chart type we need to support. Before starting, let's lay some ground rules. Our project has no JS dependencies outside of the built-in live view JS library. Adding a JS dependency would mean that we need to include Node as part of our release process. Ideally, we want to stick to Erlang and the Beam without having to add anything else to our servers. This will help us simplify deployments. And drawing on prior experience, writing JS hooks for use in Phoenix can become very complicated very quickly. We want to avoid that as well, sticking with what we know best, Elixir. So our first rule is no JavaScript. Rule number two, no JavaScript. <laughs> OK, point taken. Given the no JavaScript constraint, we're only considering pure Elixir solutions. Unfortunately, there is no D3.js equivalent in the Elixir community. After looking around to see what's out there, we decided to try out Context and Giddy. Vegalite was another one, and if you're familiar with Livebook, you've probably seen its snazzy visualizations. Vegalite only works with Livebook and does have a JS dependency, so let's take a closer look at our other options. Context is the most popular pure Elixir charting library. It supports bar charts, line plots, and even plays nicely with LiveView. It supports multi-series charts, which was a requirement for us. The downsides were the sparse documentation, complexity of the output SVG, and there was no clear way to meet our design goals. Giddy is quite interesting as it's based on R's ggplot2, which folks in the scientific community might be aware of. It has great documentation, works well with live view, and has support for the chart types we need. The downsides were the API is a bit difficult to comprehend, the charts are very scientific looking, and there was no clear way to meet our design goals. While these libraries provide the charts we need, they lack the customization desired to achieve our design goals. They both build data structures that the SVG is generated from, but advanced customization would require us to alter the data structures or overwrite the generated SVGs, neither of which is ideal. Our conclusion was that it would take more time and effort in maintenance and development to retrofit these charting libraries to our visualization needs, rather than simply doing it ourselves. Which brings us to SVG Island. This is where Mark and I journeyed together to see what visualization treasures we could find. Hey, Max, what exactly is an SVG? At a high level, 
SVG, or Scalable Vector Graphic, is a markup language for describing two-dimensional vector graphics. Vector graphics is a form of computer graphics in which visual images are created directly from geometric shapes, such as points, lines, curves, and polygons. Elements, such as polyline and text, are used together to create visuals, and attributes, such as fill and stroke, modify these elements. Now that we've looked at a high-level map of SVG Island, let's start exploring its geography in closer detail and see how SVGs are put together. The view box is our playground and the space we'll work in to draw SVGs. Here I've defined a view box with an origin point of 0, 0 and an arbitrary width and height. I've used my browser's inspect here to outline the view box. While working with SVGs, it can be helpful to use rectangles to outline the space you're working in. Here I've used the rectangle element with 100% width and height to actually see the view box. Internally, we call this debug mode, and we've used this outlining strategy as we've added other elements to the SVG. This is the io.inspect of SVG. If we think back to our school days, many of us probably studied geometry and the Cartesian coordinate system. The top right quadrant, positive x, positive y, is the quadrant applicable to SVG creation. This is how the vector graphics are created, by drawing shapes using a coordinate system. Note the origin, 0, 0, is in the bottom left corner of quadrant 1. The SVG coordinate system is similar to quadrant 1 of the Cartesian system, except the origin, 0, 0, is in the top left corner. The y-axis is reversed compared to a normal graph. As y increases in SVG, the points, shapes, etc., they move down, not up. This was one of the most challenging parts of building our own charts, and I regularly had to stop and think about this. It really helped to pause and perform the mental gymnastics of visualizing what the chart needs to look like and flipping those values upside down. Polyline is our main SVG element and what we'll use to draw the chart. Polyline works by accepting a list of XY coordinates, which it then connects together to form a line. Polyline accepts an arbitrary number of points, but more on that later. Here I'm using a polyline to draw a line from the bottom of the view box to the top of the view box. We're also going to need the text element in order to add labels or other text to our chart. Text works by adding a box of text at a given xy coordinate. Now that we have explored SVG Island a bit and have the basics down, let's test out our new survival skills and build a line chart. Mex, I have a challenge for you. You do? Yeah. OK, what is it? Explain to me how to draw a straight line. Pretend I am five years old, have never drawn a straight line before, and am using pen and paper. Really? Trust me, it'll make sense. <laughs> OK. One way that comes to mind is to pick a point to start at. Press your pen to the paper and drag your pen horizontally across and lift up your pen when the line is as long as you want. Like this? Yeah, that's a straight line. Nice. <laughs> I have another challenge. Bring it on. How would I draw a capital M? Explain it to me like I'm five, have only ever drawn a straight line before, and I'm using pen and paper. That's a bit harder. But if we use the concept established with how we draw a straight line, it's not so bad. Pick a point to start at the bottom of the M. Extend the line to the height of the M with a slight slant to the right. From the end of the first line, draw a line downwards that's half the height of the first line. 
From the end of the second line, draw a line that rises half the height of the letter M. From the end of the third line, draw a line downwards, that's the height of the letter M, with a slight slant. Like that? Yep. Looks like an M to me. Did you pick M because both our names start with that letter? Next slide. <laughs> I have a final challenge. Last one, I promise. Explain to me how to draw a line chart. I'm five years old, have only ever drawn an M before, and I'm using pen and paper. Let's start the first line down around where the 18K is. Put your pen to the paper at that point and drag upward at a slight right angle, stop at around 64K. Starting where you ended the previous line, draw a new line upwards and stop at 72K. Starting where you ended that line, draw another one down to 64K. We would keep repeating this process for all the points we want to mark on the line chart. Like so? Yep, that's a line chart. I think I see where you're going with this. So what was the point of that exercise? We have many points, and we connect them. <laughs> really? Sorry, bad fun. Couldn't help myself. <laughs> the first important takeaway is that we have two points, the start and the end of the line. This is important for our use case because we constrain the use of the polyline to only accept two points. We do this by creating a functional component that accepts exactly two sets of x and y coordinates. This was a conscious choice we made because then each line segment represents a piece of data that we can interact with. The second important takeaway is that we utilize the end of the previous line to start the next line. In the code example above, you can see that we iterate over our data set and generate coordinates for each data point. We use the end of the previous line as the start of the next line. While the end of the next line is a product of scaling the new data point to the chart dimensions. The result is that we calculate a list of line coordinates where each line represents a data point in our data set. Most of us are probably familiar with hex packages and have seen their download charts. We built a small demo app with the aim of replicating the JSON downloads chart. This demo app is available publicly and we'll provide the link at the end of the presentation so interested parties can peruse the code. Its readme has a copy of this slide deck as well. What you see here on the screen is a hand-built SVG replica. Every part was built using either polylines or text elements. We took the data from the original chart, ran it through a transformation to create a list of structs that has the x and y coordinates for each line segment. To generate the coordinates, we rely on our very important takeaway number two of our line drawing exercise using the previous line's end coordinates as the start of the current line. We also use the dimensions of the SVG viewport to scale and determine the coordinates of the end of the line. Here's that same chart, but with styling applied. All this is done with just the required SVG points attributes for the polyline and Tailwind CSS classes. It's a brief intro to Tailwind. It is a utility-first CSS framework that can be used without leaving your HTML, or in our case, our Phoenix Heeks templates. One of Tailwind's newer features is the just-in-time compiler, which we take advantage here to style SVG elements. The JIT generates styles on demand instead of generating everything in advance at initial build time. This allows us to add arbitrary values and styles without writing custom CSS. For the lines of the chart, we use this feature to style the SVG attributes of stroke width and stroke line cap. Since Tailwind has the stroke width attribute, we can use the square bracket notation to tell it to have an arbitrary value of three pixels. Stroke line cap describes how the end of the line should look. A value of round gives us that really nice connection between the polylines. 
but stroke line cap does not exist in the Tailwind library. So we again use the square bracket notation to inline that additional CSS. Here you can see how straightforward it is to just switch out a few values to change the line width, opacity, and the line caps. A big advantage with this is that we didn't have to leave the live view to go and write vanilla CSS in another file. This helps significantly with code readability and maintainability, since we were able to exclusively use inline Tailwind for styling. So we have pretty well established how to draw lines in relation to each other and the dimensions of the view box. We also know how to style them. But what about the text elements, like the labels and the legend? Let's look at the legend to see how we can position that. Here we have a small functional component where we can pass it the coordinates and value of the text for the legend. We'll use the chart width and height to determine its placement. Remember, SVG charts are upside down. So to place it in the uppermost part of the chart, we just use y equals 0. We can pass x chart dimensions chart width for its x coordinate. Wait, where's the legend? <laughs> the legend is outside the bounds of the view box. We can see it with browser inspect. Turning on debug mode to see the outline of the view box helps us get a better idea of its positioning and why we can't see it. When you set coordinates to position SVG text, you're setting the location of the left edge of the text and the baseline of the font. So that means the bottom of the text is at y equals 0, and the left edge is at the width of the view box. We can fix this by giving it some magic numbers and make its ori origin not the full width of the view box, and remembering that to move it down, we need to increase its y value. While this works, it's not ideal since that position will need to change based on the contents of the text element. It would be nice for the component to be more flexible. Max, can we do away with those magic numbers? Well, Mark, with Tailwind, we can. Once again, we rely on the just-in-time compiler and add some SVG attribute references that the Tailwind library doesn't contain, dominant baseline and text anchor. We can change the text location relative to the coordinate with these SVG-specific attributes. Setting the dominant baseline to hanging moves the text below the baseline, which is at y equals 0. Then to move the text to the left, we can use text anchor, which lets us align the text horizontally. By giving it end, we're telling it to align the end of the text with the coordinate we gave it. Now that we have a better understanding of how the line chart was built and styled, let's get into some of the live view functionality. Going back to our download chart, if you recall, we constrained our polylines to only have two points. What this allows us to do is interact with each line. We can add PHX click and click away events to each polyline. The event handlers set the tooltip assigns and will display or hide the value from the data set at the line's endpoint. Next, you might be wondering, what about updating the chart with new data? Well, updating a chart is no different than any other update we do with Live View. The above example is showing what it looks like to update the chart with socket assigns. When we receive a new data point, the coordinates are generated for it, then added to the socket assigns. It's quite hard to tell, but on each update, there's a round trip to the server and an entire redraw of the chart. Mark, is there a way we could just add the new data point without redrawing the whole thing? Here come live view streams to the rescue. If you haven't heard, streams are a new mechanism for managing large collections on the client side without keeping the resources on the server. Streams has an elegant interface to insert and delete items from a client-side collection. 
In essence, a chart is a client-side collection as it manifests itself as a visualization. Pushing the chart coordinates into a stream allows us to insert new data points without having to round trip to the server or redraw the entire chart. Well, given all these benefits for our use case, this must be super hard to implement. Actually, in three simple steps, we can take our existing functionality and get it working with streams. First, we add our chart line coordinates to a stream on our live views mount. Second, we use stream insert to add the latest line into the stream. Third, we change our comprehension to iterate over the stream instead of socket assigns. Ta-da! We now have our chart updating with live view streams. In the image above, you can see that we assign a unique ID to each line, which is its data point and coordinates. You can see in the logs that only the new data point is shown. Streams is able to use these unique IDs to determine if it has drawn the line before or not. Thus, we're updating our chart without going to the server or redrawing previous lines. Pretty neat. Now that you've seen how we built SVG charts, you're probably wondering how we came up with this approach. We started by building a bar chart with a bottom-up approach. By bottom-up, I mean we had a given design to match, and we handcrafted the markup for an SVG to match it. Once we had the markup for a bar chart, we began to abstract the chart piece by piece. We started by dynamically drawing the background lines, then the labels, then finally the bar lines. After all this abstracting was done, we had a simple bar chart component that we could pass data into, and it would draw a bar chart that visualized that data. So what didn't go well with this approach? The first problem we ran into was when we started plugging various data sets into the chart. We realized that we needed to scale the input data such that the data looked correct relative to the dimensions of the chart. Here you can see a funny image of how we saw a line shoot right up off the top of the chart and through the bottom of the chart. The second problem was in regards to click events and the positioning of the tooltip. When a user clicks on a line, the coordinates of that line are pushed to the live view. When we went to display the tooltip, we could only place the tooltip relative to the line that was clicked by the user. In this image, you can see that the tooltip was placed right on top of the line that was clicked and obstruct, obstructs other lines from view. The third problem was that we drew each element of the chart independently. This was the simplest approach at the time, but led to some alignment issues where labels wouldn't line up with the data that they were supposed to represent. In this image, you can see that the X labels do not align with the bar lines, and the Y labels do not align with the background lines. What would we do differently? Well, hindsight is 2020, and if we did it again, we'd make a few different decisions. First off, we'd start with a top-down, data-driven approach and drive the implementation based on real input data. We believe this approach would lead to only building what you need to display the data and nothing more. Second, we'd give the developer access to all coordinates on events. When with the bar chart, the coordinates were generated then immediately used to draw the chart. The developer had no way to access the coordinates. If we had given the developer access to the coordinates, then they'd have complete flexibility when reacting to chart events. Finally, we draw related elements together. We ended up with a few magic numbers to get everything to align perfectly, but a lot of these issues are best addressed by drawing 
related elements together and utilizing SVG attributes in the right places. Overall, would we recommend doing this? Well, it depends on your needs and use case. Learning SVG isn't too bad, but you do need to understand the basics to be proficient. The hardest part for us was learning to think and visualize upside down. We didn't have to add any new dependencies to our project to accomplish this feat, and we now have complete freedom to improve and iterate on our chart building process. We can come really close to making all of our designers' dreams come true. But building these components so that they are maintainable and easy for other developers to understand and use will be an ongoing effort. And that's all, folks. Um, you can find these slides and the example project at the link above. And uh, here's a photo of me on SVG Island. <laughs> <laughs>